today, which is in 1 Samuel. There's one other one after this as well. Again, 1 Samuel chapter 21, and we're going to look at verses 3, or yeah, 3 through 11. Now, therefore, this is David speaking, what do you have on hand? Give me the five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. And the priest answered David and said, there is no ordinary bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread, if only the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest and said to him, Surely women have been kept from us, as previously, when I set out and the vessels of the young men were holy, though it was an ordinary journey, how much more than today will their vessels be holy? Verse 6, So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence which was removed from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. Now one of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. And David said to Ahimelech, Now is there not a spear or sword on hand? For I brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's matter was urgent. Then the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you would take it for yourself, take it, for there is no other except it here. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. Then David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Surely or did they not sing of this one as they danced, saying, Saul is slain his thousands and David is ten thousands? Finally, flip over to Psalm 52, and we're going to look at just verse 1. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The loving kindness of God endures all day long. Well, good morning. And uh, we are beginning today in the 22nd lesson of the rise of David. And thank you, Warren, for teaching us and giving us those uh, important texts for our lesson this morning. Uh, where we find ourselves is David at Nob, where the priests are, and the providence of his life at this time is on the run. He's running from Saul. He has been made the enemy of all of Israel. And his running first to Jonathan, and, and then he went to Samuel, or he went to Samuel first, and then to Jonathan. And now he travels here, the third leg of his journey, to the priests of Nob. For what we know, he perhaps did have companions, a uh, few with him, but we're not exactly sure. The question I raised last time in our lesson, could anyone have looked less like a king than did David at that time? And yet, that's exactly what he was. He was a king, the only king in Israel. This text this morning is going to highlight that particular fact. The whole world has turned against this young man. It's flipped on him, and in an instant. His name and reputation everywhere has now been sullied. If you're living in such a providence that you had unplanned for circumstances, then you can certainly relate to where David is at this particular time. Oh, how the bolts of God in His providence come and attack us when we are so unexpected. And yet that is the spiritual life because that is the life of divine providence that He puts before us. And so here He is, looking like anything but a king coming to Nob. And he asks for help. Beginning in verse 3, what do you have on hand? 
It's literally, what do you have under your hand? Something that the priest would have charge over is the idea. And the priest answered, verse 4, there is no common bread in my charge. The term common would be the opposite of the holy bread that we read about in Leviticus. In other words, that bread has been set apart. It's set apart for the priests and it is used there for worship. So what does he have? Does he have common bread? No. He has only holy bread in that place. Now, uh, notice Abimelech offers that bread to David. Depending on the fact that he had not defiled himself morally with women. That would render David and his companions, if indeed he had companions, ceremonially unclean. I find this amusing. Those who want to delve, delve into the motive of David coming to Abimelech, misrepresenting his, his actual providence, telling him he was on a secret mission for the king, and people wanting to deal with that, uh, whether David was morally or immorally sufficient for that time. But when you come to verse 4, those guys don't say a word. And yet, look what we have. What is this about? Women. Uh, let me begin by quoting my friend Dan Duncan. The Old Testament is just not nice and neat. It doesn't just snap together like a beautiful puzzle. And you look at it and admire all the picture. It has rough edges. It has holes. It has places that we just really don't understand. We need to understand that this is a time, a culture, and a place. And men and women behave differently in that context. Uh, we could say that the revelation of God is progressive, but I don't like that term because it has uh, political connotations. We could say it's uh, evolutionary, but I don't like that term because of the connotation. So I like the term escalating. It's moving. Uh, think of it as a picture. Uh, it's fuzzy, but as you keep turning the dial, it gets clearer and clearer. The reason that people don't like to deal with verse 4 is because you have all the New Testament admonitions. Flee youthful lusts and so forth. And we can't read New Testament words and directives back into Old Testament stories because those New Testament words had never been written before. They are not the revelation of God as it is today. So what do I say? I say read it in the context that it is. It's different from what we grew up with and we understand about the Bible. But this is a different time, place, and culture. Appreciate it for where it is. Early kingship. And this is the time of David. And so, what do we know? Well, we do know that abstinence was a common practice among the soldiers in warfare during the times of war. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 11, Uriah the Hittite refused to go home to his wife Bathsheba, 
And here's his reason. My commander Joab and the Lord's men are encamped in the open country. He was living by a code. Not by the law, but by a code. An ethical standard. A part of the custom, the heritage. Just appreciate it for where it is and the time that it occurred. Don't try to understand it in terms of what we have been given today to live under. And so, verse 5, David assures Ahimelech that women have been kept away. Verse 6, and the priest acting in all innocence gave David bread generously. Although David, as we see from Leviticus, did not qualify for this bread. And yet Ahimelech bent the rules and he made exception. If we knew for certain that this was the Sabbath, it would be the perfect tie-in to our Lord's point in Luke chapter 6. Here then is the question regarding Ahimelech's decision. Why did you give bread to David provided that he was ceremonially clean. You are, you are very particular about one aspect of the law, and yet you are very liberal in another. How do we answer that question? I think the answer is Abimelech, Ahimelech himself. He is a great man. What I see of him is he is gracious, he is kind, he is meek, and that is a quality of life that I need most. F.F. F. Bruce writes, human needs take priority over ceremonial law, which is our Lord's point in Luke chapter 6. Now I went back and listened to Mark's lesson again Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, the right use of the Sabbath. I think that would be good to do in studying this passage. Here is where legalists, and they're in the church, and they have their doctrine, here's where they fail to understand the Word. God gives not because we are righteous. He gives because He is gracious. Not anything that we do of ourselves. All the time, we are dependent upon His mercy, His kindness, His generosity with every day of our lives. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul said, God who is rich in mercy. Now, look at verse 7. We have a construction that causes us to pause. It is classified. We always try to classify everything in order to understand the grammar. And it's classified as an intrusive notation. Think of it as a teaser. The... Uh, the weatherman says, boy, we've got a big change coming, but first, a word from our sponsor. Well, we're not going to leave them. We'll watch Palm Olive and whatever, Firestone Tires. What does it mean? Rain? Cold air? What does it mean? What is this teaser? We stay. That's what is going on here. You may have the word detained. One of Saul's servants was on that day kept away, detained before the Lord. The idea of the word is detention for some reason. Uh, many have speculated it was a religious reason. This man is not an Israelite, and therefore he would be subject to conform to some form of ceremonial law. Once again, the outward portion of the law. 
before the Lord. That would be the speculation that it would be something in regards to the law or God's word. So he may have violated some rule or reason. I hope you're reading John Flavel, Mystery of Providence, because uh, he specifically in that book takes note of this particular instance. Observe that he is described as Saul's servant. Now, that's important and noteworthy because back in chapter 19 and verse 1, Saul told all of his servants, David's the enemy. Kill David. That's the standing order. So he had been informed of Saul's intention. This man is named Doag, the Edomite, making him a descendant of Esau. Saul had fought with the Edomites in 1 Samuel 14. Perhaps they had taken him prisoner and as he is looking over the prisoner, someone would have said to Saul, uh, that guy you want to keep. That guy you want to bring in. Um, he's formidable. He's a leader. He's good with sheep or cattle. So, that's obviously what happens. And that's what makes his ethnicity noteworthy. Edomites were typically enemies of Israel. They had refused Israel's safe passage in the days of Moses into the land of promise. So there's lots of ethnic bad blood here. But the name and the association of the tribe raises a red flag to us. Finally, the text says, he was called the chief leader belonging to Saul. So he's a foreign mercenary of some kind in a royal Israelite bureaucracy. But there is more. Look at his title called chief herdsman. Literal translation, a mighty shepherd. This word shepherd refers to leaders, Strong men, chieftains. Now that to me is interesting. Because uh, this special man in Saul's administration uh, might be a parallel to David himself. David was a shepherd. He was a mighty man. He was a chieftain. Perhaps they were on the same level in Saul's administration. Now that gives us something to think about. He knew David was the enemy. He sees David's interaction with Ahimelech at Nob. But he does nothing. That's what I want you to remember. He does nothing. Now, in Psalm 52 and verse 1, we're rather surprised at that psalm because it doesn't open with praise or worship to the Lord God, but rather it is David taking dead aim against this man, Doak. He writes a psalm attacking him. He mocks him in line one. And his sarcasm is dripping. Mighty warrior, he says. Now that, that is interesting to me. Because it's obvious that Doag wants recognition in Saul's administration. He knows David is an enemy. 19.1. So I want to say, well, go ahead, Doag. 
Go ahead. Kill him. Attack him. You do that, you bring dead David's head back in a burlap sack, and you'll have all the stars and the stripes that you would ever want for the rest of your life. So, are you John Wayne or little Bo Peep? Oh, mighty shepherd. He does nothing. He's no fool. He knows all about David. With or without a weapon, he knows David is lethal. David ran at the giant. Are you running at David? No. He's not about to go down that road. We'll pick up Doag in chapter 22. He's going to murder Ahimelech, and he is going to murder all the priests of Nob himself. You know people like that? They're in one context. They're, uh, they're full with, of bravado. Uh, get a pastor. He's got his big choir. He's got his phalanx of uh, deacons in front of him. And he, he tells us on Sunday what we should do about this and that and this. But then get him out on the street on Monday. And he's quiet and shy and reserved. Same man. Different context. He's different. I've seen it in business. Here's a production engineer. He runs a tight ship. He's very demanding. Got a whole group reporting to him inside that big giant building. He offices. But you go take him out there and put him on location. Out there in the field. Uh, he's real proud of all of his degrees. Those men that are drilling that rig and carrying grease on their hands and all those chains around their necks, they don't even have high school educations. But he... He just runs around and calls them sir and brings them coffee because he knows he's nothing without them. Same man, completely different context. I had a guy tell me a couple of years ago, the first day I ever came to Believer's Chapel, I was startled. I'll never forget it, he said. Dan Duncan walked straight up to me and shook my hand. I said, I've never seen anything like that occur before in church. Same man, different context. Do you know what I admire about Jonathan? Look at the context that we have seen Jonathan in. He sees David face to face. And he's gracious, giving him his sword, his cloak. He is with David all alone in a field. And he is subservient to him. All alone. Nobody witnessing. And making covenant with him. And he's the same man standing before his father. And all the people... All the people that run Saul's administration, and he is defending David and in anger with his own father. He's the same man. Doag is not that kind of man. He changes depending on the context that he is in. And so, verse 9, he's in providence, finds the very sword of Goliath. It, it had been wrapped in a garment behind the ephod. It was there. 
And David says, there's none like it. Give it to me. Oh, my friends. Let everyone who is near or far, friend or enemy, now be put on notice. The man has food and he has a weapon. Let the world beware. Verse 10, And David arose and fled on that day from before Saul and came to Achish, king of Gath. The scholarly opinion is this, this term king meant that Achish was senior over all the rulers of the five tribes or towns in the land of promise, cities of the Philistines. If you want to think geography, David is going to go about 25 miles. He is going to travel out of the hills and the mountains of the promised land to the flatlands toward the coastal plain of Israel. Whatever his motive of David's decision to go to the Philistines, it's obvious right now that he thinks he is more safe among the enemies of Israel than he is his own people. I think this is somewhat humorous. He's uh, called a champion in the land. A great and mighty warrior and valiant in the land. But when you get to the Philistine territory, he's celebrity. Oh yeah. He's like something very, very special among the Philistines. Whatever he thought his attempt to be incognito, <laughs> that was quickly foiled. Now, we come to verse 11. I have spent a lot of time thinking, pondering verse 11. Uh, let me begin this way. First, a tutorial in the history of theology. It was John Calvin who was the first to teach us above anyone else in church history that Jesus Christ was both prophet, priest, and king. That meant that to follow Christ, you will see Him fulfill the lives and the ministries of the prophet, the priest, and the king. That's the hierarchy of Israel. And he did it all himself. Calvin was the first, the genius of Geneva, to see that for us. We take it for granted today. It had never been written about till Calvin. That means that when I see the priest, I see the prophet, and I see the king, I am to look for by type, by glances, by shadow, by images, anything that would resemble Christ to me. Because He's there. Why do I know He is there? Because what He said in John 5.39, the Scriptures all bear witness of Me. Now, verse 11. I want you to observe the words isn't or is not. It's a double, double negative, not. It's written that way in the inspired language. What is the point of is not or isn't? It's a phrase of observation, of discovery, bringing about a conclusion. Let's do that. I want you to observe the phrase, verse 11, 
king of the land. That is not a title found anywhere in Israel. Not there. So it's a title that is used by the Gentiles, not the Jews. Are you beginning to see a picture? David is recognized as king of the Jews. He is recognized by king of the land, by people who are not given the scriptures at all. They're Gentiles. They're Philistines. Paul would say they are not natural heirs. They're not acquainted with the promises or the scriptures at all. And yet, look at their observation. King of the land. I want you to observe that they quote this quite precisely. These Gentiles regarding his work. He has slain his ten thousands over Saul's thousands. So it is Gentiles, not Jews, recognizing first he is a king and that he is a mighty warrior. Now, why is that significant? Because liberal or conservative, all Old Testament scholarship recognizes one central theme about the Lord God from the Old Testament. He is warrior. They all recognize that. He is warrior because he took on the Pharaoh and he conquered Egypt. He is the warrior. He drove the Canaanites out of the land. He is the warrior. That is the Lord God in the Old Testament. Known that universally. And so, He is praised by the Gentiles by their own testimony. And they got it precise. What He accomplished. Now, that's the lecture. Here's the question. What would the rabbi say about what I have just announced? Well, he would say, well, they got it all wrong. They assumed he was the king of the land because of his military achievements. And how would you and I answer that? I think we would answer it like Pilate did to the Jews in John chapter 19, verses 21 and 22. You don't need to turn there. Let me read it. The chief priests and the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather a man who claimed to be king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. The providence of God sealed His words. And they are in Holy Scripture. Did the Philistines get it wrong? No. I don't think so. No. They didn't get it wrong at all. Because what do we believe? That this is God's inerrant Word. It is God breathed out on paper for us. This is the testimony that is a permanent record that is to be left. They, the Gentiles, saw David as the king. And why? Because he is the type. He is David the king Even though Israel didn't recognize him as king, he is king. And so when he came into Jerusalem, the type, our Lord Jesus Christ, what did he say? If they don't yell out, the rocks will yell out. 
He is forever the King. And this is His type. And this is His testimony. It is God-breathed. And we accept it just as it is. Not an error at all. Finally, we think about David going into the land of the Philistines. He didn't help himself very much. Riding into Gath, where Goliath was from, and that big giant sword sticking out under his coat. Shades of Marty Robbins singing to us the Arizona Ranger with the big iron on his hip. He catches everybody's attention. And those who saw him from afar, that would be the Gentiles, that'd be the Philistines, they made him celebrity. And rightly so. Because he is the type of of the only celebrity that we have. With this I conclude. There there is no celebrity in the body of Christ. None. We're all believer priests. No one kisses anyone's ring in the body of Christ. No one gives any special recognition to another in the body of Christ. We are believer priests one to another. So we need to function that way. We need to act that way. That is our strength. So let me ask you, who are you praying for? Who are you checking on? Who are you encouraging? Who are you bringing a blessing to? Who are you looking into and checking on them? We are the body of Christ. We are all priests working together, functioning in different roles and different audiences, but all one and the same. Below only one celebrity, the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd of all the sheep. And we are serving Him. We do that. We become formidable to the world. We become a bright and blazing testimony to the world. Because the world simply does not act or function like that at all. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time of study, Your Word today. We so need You in our lives to work powerfully with the fellowship of the saints. We need one another. We need Your grace. And we need to operate as You would have gifted us to do that for the grand purpose that unified we become a powerful voice, a powerful force in our community, in our city. That those who look at us from afar Say, what a powerful people these are, these Christians. And thus you are glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.